Hey there, everybody. This is Kenny and Kenny Squared with the Sports on the Positive Tip Podcast. It is so great to be on. We're we're a couple of days late, but it was all good. It was Easter, you know, and then it, it was the championship game. So it's it's good, right? Yeah. I mean, we had to do it. Like, we had to get the full tournament effect in there, especially well, since my prediction would have, like, fell to the wayside, so. Well, it's been quite a, a few days as baseball kicked off. Our Knicks lost another heartbreaker last night to the Nets. Uh, but let's let's talk about the, the tournament, man. So um, I, I liked Baylor all along. As you know, I've been talking about them since – um, you know, we said that we would start to watch college basketball again about a, about a month and a half ago. They just have, I mean, they had some good players. I, I really wasn't surprised by the results last night. I, I think I was expecting a closer game, but I, I, and don't say, don't get me wrong. Gonzaga is, is really good, but let, let's hear from you. What, what was your thoughts on the whole tournament, the final four, whole nine yards? Well, first of all, um, yeah, I will, I will give you props there. You called this from pretty much day one, like early on in the tournament. And, um, and I was on the Gonzaga train, especially after Saturday night. Like, oh, my gosh, that was like one of the craziest games in general. Um, yeah. UCLA and Gonzaga, if you missed it, watch highlights because it, yeah. it is quite the game, just the way they were going back and forth. And then UCLA ties it in overtime with like, three seconds left and then a half court heave that banks in like one of those classic moments that you'll see for a while. What to me is very interesting is the full circle effect. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but one of the guys that was broadcasting that on the college side, like locally was Adam Morrison. Um, really? Former. Okay. Yeah. He was calling it for Gonzaga. And of course, his magical run ended by a buzzer beater by UCLA. So it's kind of cool to see like that full circle effect happen. Um, yeah. I just think that's really like one of those like wow, the tournament really cool. Oh, Kenny, okay, okay. Yeah, so I, I love the full circle effect that um yeah. that Adam Morrison more or less saw. So I thought that was really cool. Do we remember who hit that shot for UCLA? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I'll see if I can look that's, it up real quick. Right. Yeah, yeah, we'll look it up. No worries. Um, I tell you though, listen, Gonzaga has gone from you know surprise team upsetting a few people. They became them this uh, model for mid majors, and now they're a, they're a national powerhouse. And I gotta really credit their their coach. You, you know, it, it is so hard to go undefeated in a season. I mean, 1976. That's a long time ago now. And you know, the thing about that Indiana team, the thing about that Indiana team is that they. They only lost one game in two years, which I think was amazing, you know, for them because in 1975, they went into the tournament undefeated and they lost in the Elite Eight to Kentucky. And a close game, final few seconds, they lost it. And then obviously 76, they they ran, they ran the table and they had an epic, they had an epic uh, game in the national semifinal against UCLA. Ironically, you know, because uh, UCLA had won the championship in 75 and they brought a lot of their players back, Marcus Johnson, and a few others, and, and Indiana beat them that year. So it's hard, but they came so close. But I just, there was something about that Baylor team, you know, between Teague, Mitchell, they've got three future NBA players on that team. And not that Gonzaga doesn't, I think Gonzaga probably has three as well. Hasper, Timmy, Suggs. I mean, they're just real. Uh, uh, a CC probably will be really good. Um, but, it, it, you know, they're just, they're just too quick. Baylor, I thought, was too quick. I thought their defense was just so good. 
it, they just they, they just played a perfect final four for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. What what were some other surprises for you? Um I had texted you about this earlier, the one shining moment. Having a sister Jean in there was kind of cool. <laughs> um but I will say too, like, especially like that's there's been a few times where undefeated teams kind of have gotten pretty far, but like that's the furthest we've had in a long time. And like, I kind of figured the game would be closer, but I think it also goes to show you how good Baylor actually is. Um, like you said, Gonzaga is like, they do everything the right way as a mid major and everything, but you got to give it to Baylor. And I also, you got to give it to their coach with, um, with the winning culture that they've kind of put together. Um, yeah, talk about that. that. That was a great article you sent me. I sent that over to uh, Randy and a few other folks today. So talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so apparently, I'm going to look this up just to kind of verify it. But according to Baylor's um, college basketball page on Twitter, they have something called joy on there. And, yeah, and it says it's the culture of joy. I'm reading it right off of their, their Twitter there. Joy is actually an acronym for Jesus, others, and yourself. Wow. Um, it's very funny, the irony of all the people that were mad at Oral Roberts still being in the tournament. And then yeah. God kind of still had the last laugh there because a team that yeah. said from the start to finish that they glorified Jesus first, then others, then yourself. Um, they have a very selfless attitude which obviously works well in basketball. If you're not worried about getting the credit, you're going to, you're going to succeed in general. Um, but then obviously putting God first, God's going to bless everything that you do. That doesn't mean that you'll always win. Right. Hence sister Jean, hence Oral Roberts. Otherwise <laughs> Liberty would win every year. Right, but like, right, right. God will still honor you in what you do. And I love how the coach he was hired in 2003, if I have that right, right? Yeah, yep. And it, it took 18 years for him to get a national championship. But, like, I think, first of all, it shows, like, one, have trust in coaches. You say this a lot, too. You hate when, like, a coach after, like, a bad year gets canned, especially in the NFL. But, like, giving that trust in the coach that, like, he's going to change this culture, sometimes it takes 18 years to change a culture. And as a result of that, he's got the culture of joy, the culture of putting Jesus first, the culture of putting others in yourself. And I think like beyond the scope of college basketball, that's going to be something that sticks in a lot of these kids' lives. You had mentioned a lot of them are probably going to be in the NBA or overseas somewhere playing basketball. But if they're not, if they just go on to like being like accountants or something like that, like they'll take that concept wherever they go. And it shows that they really have that strong culture. I feel like we talk a lot about culture on our podcast, but yeah. it's important, especially like the coach yeah. setting that, that really strong culture of let's put Jesus first. Let's put joy in our hearts and not just joy of being excited. Like Suggs was super excited. He was probably somewhat joyful when he hit that buzzer beater. Yes, but he was. Like, yeah. But like he didn't have, did he really have Jesus first? I don't know. I don't know his faith, right. but I really love that they did that. Yeah, I, it's it's an amazing story. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wow you here a little bit to tell you how much more amazing it is what Scott Drew has done here and and building that culture. So Baylor has gone through really two really bad things. They they went through some bad things with Art Riles on the football team, where uh, a lot of uh, young women were sexually abused, and he covered it up and stuff like that. And so the football team, the fact that they've been good again, has been also a testament to, to their program and their culture, how they had to rebuild it. But the basketball team, I, I hate to say it, was even worse because you had a coach named Dave Bliss who was having a little bit of success there and was doing a lot of things, though, under the table, playing, paying players and things like that. But then they had a player named Patrick Dennehy. And Patrick Dennehy all of a sudden disappears. And a couple of days later, they find his body. He was shot and killed and was dumped in a lake. And Dave Bliss then 
goes into kind of cover up mode. And so, because he didn't want the police or the NCAA investigators coming around, you know, and investigating what had just happened because of all the other stuff he was doing. So he told his players and they caught him on, one of the players was smart enough to record it. This is really a little bit before you had smartphones. I don't know what he recorded it on, but he recorded him asking the players to lie and say Patrick Dennehy, who by all accounts was a model citizen, really great guy. He wanted his players to say that he was a drug dealer and that he was involved in narcotics trafficking. And that was probably why he was killed. Now, wow. some people say that Bliss might have known what really happened. So what really happened is that Denny, he got into a little bit of a dispute with another player, Carlton Dotson. And Carlton Dotson uh, was battling a lot of mental demons. And it was Carlton Dotson who shot and killed his teammate and, and disposed of the body and everything like that. Just a horrible, horrible story. Dotson is still in jail at this, at this moment. So it's never been proven, although nobody can believe anything Bliss said after that, but it's never really been proven that Bliss knew that. He was just trying to, at, le at the very least, he was trying to cover up some of the bad things that was happening at Baylor. So, uh, you know, needless to say, he got fired, but the, the team and the uh, program, you know, took some very heavy sanctions from the NCAA. Welcome Scott Drew. <laughs> he gets hired to take this over. And similar to what I was saying about Kelvin Sampson, and that was different because the program had just lost for so many years. There wasn't any evidence of some bad things. But when Drew took over the program, he literally had to rebuild it from scratch. So thus the 18 years, because here's the thing, they, you know, after four or five years, they made it back to the tournament, but they would usually lose like in the first or second round. I think a few years ago, they got to the Elite Eight, you know, got close to getting to the Final Four. Uh, but this year, they got they got over the hump. And, you know, players want to go play there because I don't know if you realize this, I think three or four of, of those players are transfers from, like, Alabama, Auburn, a few other places. Uh, I think there was wow. one. Yeah, I think Suggs actually is a transfer from Florida. And, you know, so they – well, Suggs is on uh, Gonzaga. But uh, and yeah, he is a transfer from Florida to Gonzaga. But but Baylor also has you know several transfers. So so Drew, it it didn't surprise. I didn't know about the Joy Ackerman acronym, but that didn't surprise me at all when you sent that over because there there's something about that team and something about from where they came from that has just been crazy special. I mean, there's no other. You heard Jim Nance hit on it a little bit last night. Is this the, the best turnaround story. Like if it had happened quicker, they would have probably made a bigger deal out of it. But to me, so what it was 18 years ago, you know, that where that program came from, it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah. yeah. I would agree. That's crazy. I didn't know any of that. Yeah. It's an amazing like, oh my story. Gosh. It, it, it really is. So let, let's shift gears. Great tournament. I'm glad they got through it. Uh, and, and relatively, I think only one game got canceled. And so it was, uh, they pulled it off all in Indianapolis. I, I, you know, you think about how many games is played in Indianapolis in, in a sh relatively short period of time. I enjoyed it. It, it was a great. So here's my only, my last critique is that the shooting on some of these teams is horrible. Like everybody wants to shoot three pointers, you know? And I remember watching that Creighton game yep. and, Arkansas, I mean, they're just firing up shots, just missing left and right, you know, and, and I'm just wondering what that's about. Is that uh, because they watch the NBA game, which has become mostly, you know, three pointers and jump shooting as opposed to taking it inside. And I think that was Gonzaga's difference maker for them. They, they really weren't a big three point team. They, they were driving inside and you know, they were all about moving the ball and passing, and, and they used Timmy quite a bit, you know, inside. And, and maybe that was why they had some of that success. But I tell you, Baylor last night couldn't miss any threes. I mean, Teague was just – he was yeah. hitting nothing. Like that. So was the guy from UCLA. But they also – what I liked about Baylor is that they also had the art of, like, the 10-foot jumper, you know, the 15-foot jumper. They weren't necessarily just looking for the three-pointers. So 
that was a great tournament. But let's 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 start over to baseball. Yeah. I mean, what a yeah. crazy first opening weekend, huh? <laughs> um, tell tell me about anything that surprised you so far. By the way, the Braves are still uh, oh, are now zero four because uh, the Nationals with with less than ten players beat them today. So uh, they're 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 starting wow. out all four four, yeah, yeah. But uh, what what was wow. your what were your takeaways from this first weekend of baseball? Um, I'll start locally, well, local ish with the Yankees since I'm not in New York. But um, the Yankees pitching has really impressed me early on. Um, even Garrett Cole's pitching tonight, four shutout innings so far. Wow. Um, and he's been, he was good in his first start. Um, Jordan Montgomery last night, six shutout innings. The only one that kind of had a blip was Domingo Herman, who threw like, I think 35, 39 pitches, something like that in one inning. So it kind of just threw him off, but then yeah. he went three innings, Michael King, six shutout innings afterwards, only giving up one hit. So I've been really impressed. The hitting hasn't been there just yet. Um, Stanton had a gigantic home run grand slam yesterday. Oh, I don't know if you yeah. saw that highlight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw that um, highlight. Aaron, Aaron judge has been kind of there. Um, and it's only four games. So you can't really complain. Here's an interesting stat though. Stanton and judge have only homered in eight games together. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Cause they're not playing that much. Um, <laughs> Up until this year, yeah. they didn't play that much together. One of them and there ain't no in those games. Yeah, wow. So, yeah, it's just – that to me was insane. Um, also, the Indians, I think, are having a worse trouble with hitting, but I feel like it's more permanent and not like, oh, well, they're just off to a rough start. Uh, they started yeah. out one and three. They haven't looked too hot. Um, to me, the biggest surprise is the Houston Astros. Houston Astros are five and one. Um, it Maybe maybe the the cheating thing didn't help them as much. I'm not saying that for sure, but early on, they're getting off to a good start. A team that's struggling a lot, um, it would be the Red Sox. They did win yesterday, but they um, started out 0-3 at Fenway Park for the first time since 1948. Oh, so, that's shocking. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 1948. Man, oh, man. Um, I got to ask you about something. Going back to Mike Stanton. Or Mike Sen, John Carlos Sen. I still call him Mike Sen for some reason. Um, how 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 in the world did the Yankee fans and listen, the Met fans would know better. Carlos Beltran on opening day. How did they boo John Carlos Stanton on opening day? Because he was angry, right? He tossed the bat after he hit the home run, which is not like him. He usually like you know, yeah. uh, he he was. You could tell it affected him a little bit, even though it's not a ton of fans there. But how do you boo somebody on opening day? I mean, come on. I don't know. I feel like I've kind of felt this for the last couple of years. Giancarlo, to me, is like A-Rod was a few years ago. Like, he's like the person. guy who makes a ton of money. Um, he seems to always kind of shrink when the light's shining, except, like, in last year's postseason. Like, that wasn't too long ago. I don't know why people don't look at that and be like, wow. This guy is really good. And I feel like Judge is kind of like Jeter, where Judge can kind of do, not be as good, but I don't think Yankee fans would ever boo Judge unless they're like booing the umpires because of a bad strike call or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. I wouldn't boo him. But, I mean, we, we've talked about that before. I, I, yeah, we've talked about that before. But, I, all right, so we had a guy start his career from opening day, going eight for eight, the catcher for the White Sox. What did you think about that? That's insane. And, like, it's so weird because, like, especially a lot of, like, the younger guys, if they weren't on the major league roster last year, essentially they didn't play because there was no minor leagues. So, like, kind of having, like, a full year off of baseball and then starting out eight for eight is absolutely insane. White Sox need that, though, because they lost Jimenez for the year. So they need that offense. Hopefully not too much, though. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, uh, he's a big boy, too. He, he looks like he hasn't missed many uh, fields, you know. Um, 
How about the Dodgers and Justin Turner and Clay Bellinger, the uh, home run that only turned out to be a single? That one was weird to me. Um, Cause like looking at it and I guess like, it might be a little challenging, but also like, why didn't Cody Bellinger say like, go forward? Like this is a home run. He was, I feel like he was lost in the applesauce too. Yeah. Um, but it was kind of funny to see like everyone very confused about it. And they're like, Oh, it's just a single, but then Justin Turner still scored. Right. Do I have a, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I, they gave him like three RBIs, right. Or they gave him two RBIs or something like that on it. Cause yeah. there was a, right yeah um so technically they let him score but they called bellinger out i guess right or maybe they gave him a single call i don't remember but either way he, lo- he lost a home run you know? yeah i mean and these are two veteran players though that's what you know that's what i'm like what i mean <laughs> yeah i, I listen until we get it it looked like he caught it because he definitely you know he had it in his glove and it dropped you know over the fence yeah. so i i part of me i, I got that is just I would have just said I would have expected more from the Dodgers, you know, and and Justin Turner and you know Bellinger. I mean, those are Cody Bellinger. I said Clay Bellinger before, who was his father. Yeah, uh, Cody. yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing too. Like, this is the defending champions here. We're not talking you know, about like, I know. although the the A's. I was gonna say the A's. The A's are 0 five, by the way. Um, I didn't realize but, like, that. We're not. Yeah. We're not talking about like the Tigers or like. I don't know, the Orioles, like, this is a team that won the World Series last year. How are you having these bad base running blunders? And Mookie I, Betts is on your team. He's like the base, best base runner in baseball. Yeah, that was surprising. Yeah, it's embarrassing. That doesn't happen often. So I sent you um, yeah. a text that I remember clearly when that happened against the Mets. That was Tim McCarver, who was obviously a 1976 a veteran player, and Gary Maddox, who also was a veteran player. But it was more McCarver's fault because he wasn't looking up because um, it was the same thing. Maddox thought the ball was caught, caught, you know, but it was it was to right field and he's running back to first base. So you thought he had a better view. But, so, yeah. but McCarver is just with his head, st- head down and he runs right past him. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that and they, they, they call that also a grand single. It was going to be a grand slam. And I, I remember that clearly. I remember watching that game. You know? So... But baseball wow. off to a good start. This should be a fun, fun season. Let's let's stay on baseball for a second because I did want to talk about this. The the all-star game. That and, and we don't talk politics here, you know, but I I gotta I gotta say something about this because I probably am in the minority a little bit. So moving the all-star game out of Atlanta, I, I have just a couple of problems with that, right? Um, I think that. And listen, the baseball's got a really good commissioner. Rob Manfred is, I think, really good for the most part at what he does. I would like to see the DH this year. It seems like it's a definite for next year now, but whatever. Get rid but of Hank, the extra inning rule. I hate it. Hey, yeah, no, get rid of that. <laughs> now, Hank Aaron, though, passing away, icon, one of the greatest players in history. It, it just so happens the All-Star Games there in Atlanta, right? So... Now, listen, I'm not educated enough to know the ins and outs, and, and I don't have the patience to probably read the full law. I probably should. So I want to preface what I say by that. But pulling out of Atlanta, to me, was easy. And, and here, here's the other thing that bothers me, and I'll get back to the easy part in a second, how they could have made it a little bit harder. The other thing that bothers me is that you've got vendors and venues of everyday folk like you and I that were probably counting on that extra revenue of the All-Star Game coming. Because obviously the All-Star Game, NBA also get hockey also get, when it's in your town, Super Bowl, it's going to generate a lot of money because you're going to have people that travel in and they're going to spend money. And so, you know, vendors that would have gotten a couple of extra days of, of pay, right, for, for the Home Run Derby, then for the All-Star Game itself, you know, they, they're not going to make that money. And so to me, then it hurts them. But here's the other part for me that was short-sighted, and maybe they did talk about this, but what would have been the harm in baseball saying, we're staying in Atlanta, but our players are concerned, and we want to have conversations. So, uh, you know, Mr. Governor would love to meet with you 
and would love for you to meet with some of the players and educate them on what this law actually is. On the surface, this law seems, seems terrible. I don't, I don't think for a second it's a bad thing for all of us that vote to show ID. You know, I mean, I think that's a no brainer. But then some of the things that you hear, you can't, you know, some, you can't have water or someone can't feed you water or give you a drink or something like that. Some of that. I, but again, I'm not educated on it, so I don't know the ins and outs on that. But what in the world has happened to us having conversations with each other? You know, instead, OK, we're not going. Um, and that's how and, and there's a time to boycott. I'm not saying there isn't. But maybe this would have been time to say this is you know, when is Atlanta going to have the all-star game again? Hank Aaron just died. I don't want to ruin those plans. How can I do the best of both worlds and really sit down and have some serious conversations? And, and maybe you stay an extra day. You know, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you ask a, a group of players to stay Wednesday so that they can, you know, really have those conversations. They even can talk to fans and stuff like that. And they come back and they're more educated, you know, on it. And now, at the end of the day, they could get very educated and still totally disagree. That's fine. That's that's what America's all about. Why can't we disagree? I mean, we see so many places in the Bible where, you know, folks had disagreements, but they came together, you know, afterwards. And, you know, so I, I thought that just pulling out was just the knee jerk. That was the easy reaction. And I would have liked to have seen baseball take a step further. I mean, and, and, and so what, what was your take? Yeah, um, well, like you said before, we're not trying to go political here. Um, looking at it from like the purely baseball thing, a lot of these events do bring in a lot of money. Um, Cleveland just had the All-Star Game two years ago for baseball. Cleveland's going to have next year's NBA All-Star Game, as well as the NFL Draft in a couple weeks. Um, Roger Goodell is going to be announcing Zach Wilson to the Jets, probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> um but like and I, I see definitely like there's a lot of money that people make in there whether it's like through places that people have to eat places that people have to sleep Hotel. Um, like yeah. Yeah, yeah. I took our learning center kids yeah um like what is it two three days after Isaac was born I took our kids to uh like this interactive all-star game stuff like it was yeah. like a whole bunch of fun and games and activities yeah. like that to leave space for all that. It just be, it's a very big and buzzing event, like hundreds and hundreds of people from like all different press areas and while be officials, like it's huge. So like losing that money is a big statement, but also kind of like what you said, I feel like not having that conversation isn't a good thing. Now there is precedent. Um, if you remember 2017, the NBA pulled the All-Star game a lot closer to the date because of the, uh, the transgender bathroom laws that were passed. No, um, they moved it to sure. Vegas. Sure. Yeah. Um, which like, which is like, part of me is like, oh, wow, that's like good that they care. But at the same time, like, they don't really care that much because two years later, as far as I know, that law was never repealed. Two years later, the NBA had the All-Star Game in Charlotte. So, like, I don't know if they're really doing anything. I think it's more of just, like, the PR move of, like, we don't want to seem, like, racist or hateful, so we have to pull out. Um, my guess is they were probably more worried about losing more money or, like, let's say a guy like Mookie Betts decides I'm not going to the All-Star Game because it's still in Atlanta. Although I don't know if anyone would actually do that. But a verse that um, had come to me a couple of weeks ago, um, Proverbs 10.10, 10, people who wink at wrong cause trouble, but a bold reproof promotes peace. I feel like there's a sense of winking at wrong here, where like the MLB is kind of like, yeah, we don't really like this, bye. And I, I would hope that along with this decision to move to Colorado, that there are conversations and that there's like, a little bit more information on how like how and why they don't agree with this voting law and also providing funding and support for Atlanta based um, organizations that are helping people that are struggling with voting like there's got to be a lot of organizations that help with like lobbying and 
like citizenship and everything like that. So like, I feel like this is like their, we're clean, we're good. Kind of like Pontius Pilate washing his hands. Like, yeah. this isn't yeah. my problem anymore, but yeah. I guess we'll see. Yeah, it, it's, 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 I just think it was the easy way out. And, and at the end of the day, if they had did, and I don't know the research they did, but maybe if they did a little bit more, maybe they still would have decided, you know, it's not a good time for us to go there. Because, yeah, I, you know, I didn't think about that. There could have been some players that would have would have said, hey, I'm not I'm not going. You know, I'm just not going to go. But I just think that it's a symptom of how we sometimes become where we just don't have conversations. And MLB, that, you know, the commissioner – I guarantee, like, I can't, I can't pick up the phone and call the governor. He, he's not going to take my call, especially since I live in New York, right? But I guarantee you, if they said, hey, you know, Mr. Governor, Rob Manfrey, the commissioner of baseball is on the phone, wants to talk to you, he would have taken the phone call, you know, and, and then they can have a conversation and say, hey, listen, you know, part of me is getting ready to boycott this. I don't want to do that. Let's set something up for Wednesday for, for after the game, you know, and and, and, and let's have some honest dialogue. And that would have been great for MLB to, to even, you know, film that or show it, you know, that would have shown that they cared. So I don't know. I don't know. But all right. We, we got one more quick story that is just the opposite of what we try to talk about. And I cannot for the life of me <laughs> understand Kevin Durant. I just, I, I don't, I don't understand. Just like Paul Pierce. We can talk about him next week. I, I just, I, I can't. I oh can't my understand. gosh. I, I mean, and Paul Pierce is not a, a young guy. Neither is Kevin Durant. And so I, I just yeah. don't get it. Now, now, Michael Rappaport, he's no angel either. He's no shrinking violent. I mean, you know, but Durant's got to be bigger than that, especially with all the problems he had on social media in the past, opening up burner accounts and everything like that. He, he strikes me as so sensitive where is that when you're in that type of position, you got to have a much thicker skin and he still hasn't grown. I mean, I didn't realize that he's now been out 23 straight games too, you know? So, I mean, maybe that's bothering him because he hasn't been playing. I don't, I don't know what it is, but how do you send tweets like that? And you're, you know, you're disparaging the people that you're supposed to be standing up for, you know, um, I, and everything at the NBA, you know, you have, you're playing in the bubble last year. You have equality, and but yet he takes the, the opportunity to call this guy all sorts of names, which they I, I've never seen the tweet because they keep blurring it out, and I don't. But I can kind of figure out what he said. I mean, so what? I, I'm just I'm puzzled by it. I mean, what what were your thoughts? Um, I did read the tweets. Um, they were bad. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll just say that. Um, he, he says a lot of like homophobic names. He calls his wife names. Um, he then like challenges him to a fight and also says, I'm going to spit in your face. Um, just that's, that's the spark notes version of it. Not good. Um, I'm going to also add this because I've seen it before. I just Googled it, just double check. Kevin Durant calls himself a Christian. Um, I heard he says that. that, like, apparently, um, I remember when, maybe it was when he was with OKC, he used to go to Hillsong Church in New York City when either, like, off-season or any time that he was playing in New York. So, first of all, Christians should be held to a higher standard. Um, and also, to me, there are some people, like, personally, if I was, like, actually famous, I would not have social media. It's just not worth my time. The second that you say something that's slightly controversial, it's bad. It's just yeah. not worth it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Kevin Durant needs to just delete Twitter. He needs to get off of social media because he'll, he'll go after anyone and everybody. He needs to stay away from it. There, it's like that concept in the Bible where it says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to go into heaven with one hand than to go to hell with two. So, like, I think that Kevin Durant needs to kind of evaluate that. But I also think Michael Rappaport was kind of in the wrong here, too. Oh, no Because, like, the Bible says that, um, like, when it comes to conflict, if you have an issue with someone, you go to them in private. And then if, if you can't win them over, bring somebody else in and then bring it to the church. So, like, 
I understand that Michael Rappaport got like threatened and everything like that, but him making those tweets public was also kind of a jerk move. Um, I think it's important, especially like we're talking about like having conversations and everything like that. I think it's important to try to have that conversation. I know conflict is always touchy and hard, but it's also important to do it the right way. If he went to Kevin Durant and said, hey, man, I'm sorry for, for calling you out. I won't do it. Look, I'll unfollow you. I'll kind of leave you alone. Everything will be fine. And if at that point he starts latching back, then, okay, take another step. But then just coming out like, yeah, look, this is what he said. It just kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. Yeah. I, I, you know, like I said, he's no shrinking violent either. You know, Rappaport, you know, he, um, I, I'm sure he knew he was who he was poking. And I'm sure he also knew that, how sensitive Durant is. You know, last thing I'll say, I, I love that, uh, you know, that, that you said that we should be held to a higher standard. And, and, and of course, none of us know that, that you're going to be perfect, but you have time to walk away on Twitter. You have time to just put the phone down and, or just shut it down and, and, and walk away. And I start to think about, you know, Kevin Durant wants to be up there with the greats of all time. And there's no doubt on the court, he is definitely there. Steph Curry wouldn't have done that. Michael Jordan wouldn't have done that. Kareem Jabbar wouldn't have done that. You know, go on and on. LeBron James wouldn't have done that. You know, they I, they would have known better. You know, and Kobe Bryant wouldn't have done that. It, it's just, you know, I don't I don't know what he's thinking at times. And and it's not the first time with him. Like I said, he's, you know, he's gotten himself into trouble on social media before. I, I just we can talk about Paul Pierce next week. I mean, I just like. I don't know how you're also one of the 50 best players of all time and, and you're 43 years old. And I mean, you don't realize the camera's on and, and just, and, and the way he reacted when he left, we'll, we'll talk about more next week, but, um, you yeah. know, so, so listen, it, it, a lot going on, uh, a lot to look forward to as baseball starts to heat up, uh, NBA starts to heat up. Next thing you know, playoffs will be around the corner and uh, still a lot to talk about. So, um, let me get the music going, and uh, why don't you take us home? All righty. Well, continue to enjoy opening week. Um, go Baylor. Joy. Have some joy this, this upcoming week. Jesus, others, and yourself. But for now, this is Kenny Squared N. Kenny. Sports on the positive tip. We'll see you guys next week. All right. Talk to you later.